Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Matt Roth at Baylor College of Medicine, and I welcome you to today's presentation as part of the Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium webinar series. The ERCC is an NIH Common Fund program which works to advance the science and research of extracellular RNA. Stage one of the consortium started in 2013, with the second stage starting with a kickoff meeting in September of this year, just a couple months ago. The consortium hosts monthly presentations on a variety of research topics, and I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Gustavo Stolovitsky, IBM Fellow and Program Director for Translational Systems Biology and Nanobiotechnology at the IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, New York. The title of Gustavo's presentation is Isolation, Tissue-Specific RNA Markers and Early Cancer Detection Studies in Circulating Extracellular Vesicles from Prostate and Liver Cancer Patients. Gustavo? Thank you, Matt, and thank you, everybody, for uh, coming to this webinar. Uh, that title was a mouthful, uh, but that's more or less what we are going to be walking through the, um, through the hour. So first, I'm going to be talking to you about um, one of the um, activities in my group at IBM, uh, which is the development of technology for separation of um, extracellular vesicles, a technology we, we call nano-DLD. Then we are going to be comparing nano-DLD with other technologies and discuss some uh, work in progress in terms of uh, new technology for purification, um, after which we are going to be using nano-DLD and uh, ultra, uh, ultra centrifugation to study uh, comparatively uh, markers in prostate cancer um, that are of uh, indicative of prost prostatic origin in exosomes as well as uh, biomarkers for early detection of liver cancer. And after um, that, I will conclude and wait for your questions. So the objective of our group at IBM is to develop technology to um, facilitate the early detection of cancer. And here is a little bit um, succinctly a a uh, set of um, markers that people have used in the in the past decades to um, to do that. And, um, the the first one is the circulating tumor cells, uh, which uh, was and still is to some extent very popular. But uh, you know, it's not a good uh, way to detect for early detection because uh, the um, the amount of circulating tumor cells when when the cancer is small is 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 not a big number, and so. Is sensitivity is a problem, but um, circulating cell-free DNA and extracellular vesicles that contain markers uh, of cell of origin, uh, if the cell of origin is uh, a malignant cell, uh, are uh, very much under study. And so our group has focused on the study of exosomes, in part because it's a tough problem that um, our nanotechnology expertise could um, could address. Um, personally, I believe that uh, it's not that it has to be one or the other. Um, it would be ideal if um, uh, uh, you know assays for for detection could leverage both uh, modalities. But we will focus today on exosomes. Um, as most of you know, uh, the concentration of exosomes can range from the billion to the trillion per milliliter. Uh, um, the exact amount depends on, on which flow, fluid. Not. And the size um, ranges between um, 30 to 150 nanometers. Uh, and that is what makes the problem difficult. They are very small. So let's discuss a little bit um, whether recent successes in um, in the use of um, exosomal markers um, in the clinic so uh, uh, probably the best the best um, example is the example from uh, exosome dx uh, recently acquired by biotechne that uh, developed a technology for um, a urine test uh, detection of high-grade prostate cancer uh, for Gleason scores uh, 
bigger or equal than seven. Gleason score is a measure of how uh, aggressive the prostate cancer is. And that uh, was based basically on, on three markers, um, two that are known to be prostatic and the other one is used as a normalization factor. The, the, um, the paper that reports on this, um, uh, these markers um, shows that the area under the curve, which is a measure of um, accuracy, was 77%, uh, which is uh, considerably better than the 66% of the standard of care, which is um, uh, prostate-specific antigen, PSA, and uh, digital rectal examination. Um, so the, the good news is that uh, this is being paid for by, by health insurance now, and so it's probably is going to be uh, one of the, the tests that will be routinely used uh, for pro uh, screening of prostate cancer. So that is kind of the example that probably many more will follow soon, hopefully. One of the problems with the, the detection of exosomes and, and the use of it for biomarkers is the fact that uh, I, their isolation is complicated and you know, has some challenges, such as contamination with, um, with different uh, species that maybe you don't want to see. Uh, reproducibility, the lack of automation, and that somehow the the the, the um, lab equipment some for UC for example is is big is not uh, something that you can um, you know scale up and uh, so so there are problems with it but but people are it's not that this has stopped people from studying this and so. Um, you know, when, when we looked at this, the ultracentrifugation use was 56% of uh, all the um, tools used for exosome isolation. But there are other tools such as um, uh, filtration or um, uh, size exclusion chromatography or, or uh, pull downs with magnetic beads and, and so on. So our technology is based on... Um, what we call lab on a chip is a, a, the basic technology is called deterministic lateral displace, displacement. And it's based on a continuous flow that smoothly brings particles from one side of the world to the other side of the world, from one side of the chip to the other side of the chip. Uh, can you see, uh, Matt, can you see my cursor? Uh, yes, it's a little small, but yeah, you can see that. Okay, you can see it. Okay, so basically, um, what the deterministic, deterministic lateral displacement technology allows us to do is to separate big particles from small particles, where the small particles will try to follow the the streamlines and kind of zigzag around the pillars that are deposited on the on, on a substrate. So, the, so this is, I should have said, a pillar array that, uh, in which the pillars are organized in such a way that there is a natural angle created by uh, a, a, a shift row by row in the pillar. And, uh, and the small particles, when you flow uh, fluid and buffer through it, will uh, zigzag, whereas the bigger particles will try to zigzag but find the next pillar and bump against it. And so the, the, the direction in which the bigger particles will go um, is clearly different than the smaller particles. And you know, here we can see that, you know, the, a repeat of that, that the small particles will go uh, zigzagging, whereas the big, bigger particles will try to go in the angle of the array. And the, the important parameter here is the um, distance between pillars uh, along a row. And, uh, and with that information and, and also the, the, uh, the angle, you know, the, uh, this angle of, um, that, that is created by the shift of the rows, you can estimate uh, using some theory, which we, I will show later is wrong, but is uh, roughly correct. 
um, wrong in the details. Uh, the critical diameter that separates the particles that go straight from the particles that go uh, in zigzagging. So this is a macroscopic demonstration, something you know which is about 10 centimeters by 20 centimeters, in which a big particle will fall bumping against pillars, uh, which, which here are big, uh, whereas the small particles will find a way to zigzag around the pillars and therefore um, end up in a different um, of, of, of this pillar array where we can collect them. So, right, cl clearly this is um, only for demonstration of big things. The, the DLD technology has been used in the context of micro particles and we challenged ourselves to bring that technology to the realm of the nanoparticles where life is brownian and, and you know, they, they are, um, all, the, all the particles of, of sufficiently small size are jiggling with the, you know, the, the movement of the uh, buffer that, that where they live. And so what we did um, in this paper uh, published in 2016, is uh, prove that we can actually separate uh, particles. That is, uh, we can uh, that, uh, find particles on one side that are la large and, and on another side, we will find the smaller particles. So in order to do that, we created this chip and, um, and the demonstration proceeded uh, using what we call a full input um, uh, injection and uh, all the particles will come this way and because depending on the on their size the bigger ones will go this way and will form this wedge whereas this the smallest one will go straight and so what you can see here in these movies is um, the the fact that the sufficiently big particles are found at the exit only on this side of the array the intermediate particles will kind of uh, be neither occupying the whole uh, width nor going all, only to the to the side. So this is a partial displacement, and uh, the smallest particles will go straight. So this this was the demonstration, and, and these smallest particle were twenty nanometers particles. They were bits, in this case. So clearly, we can see that uh, the arrays are working in the nanoscale. And um, the, the, before we were um, discussing the uh, full uh, injection in the whole input of the array, here we are doing the uh, injection by focusing, um, using, uh, focusing jets that uh, makes the analyte be concentrated on a jet here. And what we will see that uh, this is a combination of two uh, types of particles, one, one of size 110 nanometers, the other one of size 50 nanometers. And what you see here is that this, um, this um, lab on a chip technology clearly separates the bigger particles that go in an angle from the smaller particles. So, so that was the demonstration with bits. What you can see here is that they do the same thing with exosomes. And actually you can see one exosome at a time as the trace is shown, you know, traversing the, the array. Here is at the input, here, uh, you know, at the inlet, here is when they start to um, enter the, uh, the pillar array. And this is almost at the output where basically everything is um, pretty much against the wall. So the um, aggregation and integration of all these traces can be seen below. And so all these are exosomes that are marked with a fluorophore. And uh, therefore you see that uh, before they enter in the array, they form this jet. As they enter the array, they start to um, go in, a, uh, in an angle and at the outlet of the array, they are pretty much against the wall. So I was uh, mentioning that the, um, the theory is uh, almost correct, the one that uh, we discussed before, uh, as was um, advanced by the first paper on deterministic lateral displacement published by Bob Austin in 2004. 
But we started to observe that this, even the smaller particles have some, um, some angle of deviation. And so I wanted to just briefly mention that uh, the, the uh, you know, a little bit more um, uh, correct theory we, we published a couple of years ago, uh, in which we show that the details of the, of the size of the pillars and how far one pillar is from the other uh, in the y direction or in the x direction uh, impacts the final uh, angle of displacement of the particles. And, and this plot on the top left shows uh, how this, the diameter of the particle of the pillars uh, with respect to the interpillar distance in the y direction is uh, a parameter that is important with respect to the deviation of the smallest particles, which be before I was saying that the smallest particles should not deviate, therefore the angle of displacement should be zero, like the blue line here. But actually we observe that it deviates. And what this allowed us to do is to, you know, play with the geometry in such a way that we can concatenate different um, arrays and obtain um, different desired properties such as condensation because in one end so that you can um, have a full uh, inlet injection uh, of, of the particles but eventually you can concatenate to something after you condense all the particles here uh, making it become a, essentially a, a focused injection and um, more about this is in the PNA's paper so I will on this, but the important thing here is to say that we can concatenate um, different chips and, um, and different uh, designs and uh, get beh behaviors that, that are, uh, you know, as desired. Let's compare now how the Nano DLD compares with other technologies. Uh, and we looked at um, four other technologies uh, in a paper that was published in Lab on a Chip uh, in. 2018, last year, um, and the technologies was um, uh, the QEV column, that is um, a size exclusion chromatography column, the XOEC kit by KiaGen, that is um, membrane affinity column, as well as ultracentrifugation and density gradi gradient ultracentrifugation, uh, all against our, our nano DLD chips. And so here is a summary of uh, some of the important properties. Uh, let's look at, we looked at urine and, and serum uh, and the particles that are obtained in the bump area of the array at the outlet of the array. And so what we are seeing here is that the amount of particles that you get there per milliliter of input fluid. This is something that you would like you know, as big as possible because you want to get as many particles as you want. And here I say particles because we know that we are separating particles of a particular size, typically between 60 nanometers and, and about 150 nanometers, um, that also contain some lipoproteins that we at this point are not, are not um, um, you know, purifying the exosomes from the lipoproteins. But here we are saying that how many particles you get per uh, milliliter of input. And obviously you want this to be big because if you want to get as much marker per milliliter of blood, you would like this to be big. And here we say that for urine in, in that particular um, comparison, Nano DLD didn't do that bad, but uh, XOEC was the winner. Whereas for serum, we were uh, XOEC didn't do as well. Whereas Nano DLD was more or less the same as uh, the QEV SEC column. Um, let's go to yield. Yield is basically um, how many proteins you have at the outside uh, in the bump area of the array versus the uh, input. And so here you would like the, the yield to be close to 100%, right? You want all the uh, particles at the input to be at the output. And here we, we see that uh, nano DLD is the winner um, with about 60% of yield compared to um, the second, the runner up was about 30%, uh, whereas ultra centrifugation plus density gradient is more in the 5%. And um, the same is, uh, was the case for serum. 
so um, in summary, uh, what we have is a competitive or better than other technologies. One important con uh, consideration is the processing time. And so here we are seeing that the nano DLD has a, a yield in serum of about 50% plus minus, but uh, which which is comparable to QEV, if you will, but but um, uh, 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 but but much better than ultracentrifugation plus density gradient or ultracentrifugation alone, and clearly they are done in a shorter time. So you want to be as close to this, you know, up and on the left of this axis as possible. The same is true for for urine. One of the interesting things about nano DLD is that in the hands of our um, of, of uh, our engineer Josh Smith, who's um, uh, the, the person who's designing all this uh, arrays, uh, along with uh, Ben Wunsch uh, in our group, um, you can change the design in such a way to um, improve some of the um, you know desired outcomes. For example. You can change where you collect the uh, the proteins, the the sorry, the exosomes or the extracellular vesicles, so that you are as close. You, you can uh, increase the concentration. For example, here, uh, if we collect in about ten percent of the full width of the array, we will have some concentration. But if you uh, collect in about 0.1 percent, um. Let's see, uh, ten percent to um, here about one percent. Uh, you have a much higher concentration. Now we verify that by looking at the uh, input, which which is uh, uh, in its units. We are measuring the concentration. So concentration of input to input is one clearly. But here the concentration of output in the bump to the input is about sixty times when you have. Uh, a collection wall that is very close to the wall. So in, in principle, we can modify some of the parameters as needed and desired. Let me now move to um, discuss a little bit the issue of purification. So what, um, what happens here is that basically assume that and this is, this is a schematic that you have some sort of background, for example, protein or DNA or anything that comes with your solution uh, with a biofluid bio fluid. And also you have, um, you know, the, the target colloid in our case, extracellular vesicles with some concentration. Our nano DLD separates by size and therefore what you get at the end of the day with uh, when you have the uh, full injection uh, and you get the bump uh, fraction, what you will have is that the fraction of uh, smaller particles, proteins, DNA, um, uh, nucleosomes, will be, will be the, sa the same here as was in the input. The only thing that you will have is a much higher concentration of the input analyte. So in a way, the, the array in the design that I was just showing um, before um, is an enrichment array. But we know that for some applications, it's important to uh, have all the smaller particles. For example, if, if it is nano, if, if it is nucleosomes or uh, they contain um, uh, DNA or if it is uh, RNA that might confound with the um, uh, marker that, you, that we are looking for, then we want to also get rid of these fractions of uh, smaller particles that will uh, be contaminating the, the, the bump um, channel. And for that, um, what uh, we do is, instead of having the full uh, uh, input uh, injection, what we have is a way to inject, like we said, showed before, um, that basically will uh, let all the smaller particles go straight or maybe with a little um, angle, as we said before, but the, the bigger particles will totally go to the wall. And therefore what you will have here is uh, the purified sample, whereas the buffer that was put here will carry with it all the waste that, uh, that are things that we don't, we don't want. So this is the, um, uh, integration of this idea into a chip uh, in which we have uh, fluorescein uh, in the inlet 
And you can see that the fluorescein is diffusing as it goes uh, straight, but the bigger particles are, uh, which in this case are uh, fl fluoresce uh, fluorescent beads, are collecting at the wall and eventually um, you can collect here what uh, would be in a, a real sample exosomes or exosomal vesicles of the, the size that we decide and not the smaller particles that you have here. So in the injection, you have both. At the output, you have a purif purified version of the input with the particles that you want to have there. So um, in, uh, in a, um, early uh, experiments that were done at the lab by Ben Wunsch, uh, we have done two, inject two stages in which we first separate um, the bump channel uh, fraction and that was run because we don't have the two chips uh, the purification and the uh, enrichment chips in the same chip that um, you know was run independently and so if the pur the purity met concentration of particles at the output divided that by the concentration of protein at the output and so um, here we we are showing what would be um, uh, what we found for urine. So basically, let's take a look at this table at the table on the lower left, and the metric of um, uh, purity metric of particle concentration to protein concentration that we get after the two stages is of the order of fifteen hundred. That means that we have, uh, you know, with respect to the to the input, we have uh, 1,000 better and more purified um, particles that uh, that are also enriched uh, in exosomes than um, than uh, you know, uh, and we have have gotten rid of most of the protein that is undesired. Uh, of course, that if we are looking for biomarkers and and we are interested in. Um, um, RNA biomarkers, we want also to have a way to show, and we, we desire to see that that um, the replicability of the quantitation of RNA, if you run two runs of nano DLD, um, is, is similar. And so here we took, uh, we did an experimental design in which um, we had uh, prostate cancer a patient uh, that um, the sample was, um, uh, this was serum, I quoted into two parts, and each of the two parts were run uh, two times, um, one with nano DLD and the other one with ultracentrifugation. And so uh, in the, uh, here where it says figure E, what we are seeing is two run, the two runs of nano DLD that um, that were run with you know uh, different chips, and what we can see is that the quantification of each point here is a is an uh, RNA um, gene or, or uh, of different biotypes could be um, microRNAs or um, tRNAs and and so on, but each of them is one of them, and what we can see is that the correlation is pretty good uh, in the two um, in the two runs versus uh, the situation here in which we have the two uh, transcriptome after RNA-seq um, that were separated with ultracentrifugation. And we see that there is a little bit of a, you know, a, a weird um, area here where uh, one of the runs seems to have more of one of the, of the uh, you know, more of the same gene, RNA gene, than, than the other run. And this is something that we have seen over and over. And so this is one of the indications that ultracentrifugation might not be a, um, um, re, um, reproducible uh, in terms of the quantification of RNA versus uh, nano DLD seems to be more. This is another way of looking at it. And I will discuss this in a second when we talk about a few um, experiments we did with patient samples. Here we have about um, seven patient samples. Five of them were done both with ultracentrifugation and nano DLD. We also did ultracentrifugation um, for the urine. So what we want to show here is basically the reproducibility of, of the different technologies. 
Here we have the prostatic tissue of the same patients that because they had prostate cancer, they had a prostatectomy. So you have, we have the tissue as well, the, the prostatic tissue as well as the um, exosomal and urine uh, uh, fluids. So we can see here um, the uh, correlation matrix of the different patients. Uh, for example, here, patient with a patient would be correlation one, but patient one with patient two, they don't need to be too correlated, but you expect them to be because it's the same tissue, right? Um, the equivalent of the for uh, the nano DLD um, isolation of exosomes and after that um, RNA seq, we can see a very uh, close um, uh, indication that. Uh, we are measuring things that are very correlated one with the other. But when you look at, for example, um, ultracentrifugation uh, done on urine, you see that the correlation is a little bit weaker. And when you see the ultracentrifugation done uh, from serum, <clears throat> with um, you see these these points here, um, you know uh, that that are not as uh, correlated. However, serum with serum is relatively well correl correlated. Uh, even though one is done with UC and the other with nano DLD. Now, some of you, my, my, this is also uh, another indication of uh, independent indication of reproducibility of nano DLD. Some of you might remember this. This paper was presented in this same uh, webinar forum, and um, many of you probably are also co-authors here. Um, and this paper basically um, tried to. Um, take all the wonderful data that is in the XRNA Atlas uh, resource of which probably you are familiar, different biofluids, different conditions, different um, types of um, questions asked, uh, you know, be EVs, exosomes, and so on. And uh, take that and you do a simple TSNI plot or a PCA plot, what you see is that they separate very clearly to who did the experiment, where it was done, but not according to biofluids or not according to, to the condition. And so uh, uh, the question asked in this, in this paper was, um, maybe there are ways in which you can get rid of, of the noise, the things that are probably more um, technology or laboratory uh, um, uh, related and keep the biologically mean, meaningful invariant um, extracellular, extracellular profile signatures that maybe have to do with the things that are conserved, you know, from experiment to experiment. And it was done by um, a very um, intelligent trick of the convolution uh, that I will not have time to discuss today is in the paper. Um, from, from this very beautiful uh, analysis, it was um, concluded that there are clearly four types of uh, cargos probably um, carried by different carriers. And um, uh, uh, the details of this is, is a little bit um, involved and we don't have time to discuss. But the interesting thing is that one of the technologies that was used in order to see uh, whether with this observe the same, um, the same uh, kind of uh, uh, presence of different was the nano DLD uh, array. And, you know, this is not particularly visible in the paper, um, but you can, but one of the figures um, clearly shows that the nano DLD on the seven patients that we discussed before consistently seem to have, um, uh, you know, um, the signature of one of the uh, cargo types, which was uh, named cargo type four, uh, in, in the seven patients, five of them had the maximum peak of the profile with cargo type four, whereas only two patients had a cargo type uh, two, which uh, different from what we see from ultracentrifugation in which you have a little bit out of five, you have two in cargo four and and three in cargo type one, and the ultracentrifugation with plasma, you are all over the place. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is, it seems from different ways of looking at the transcriptomics of the exosomes isolated with nano DLD, 
that uh, this, this signal seems to be very reproducible. Now, how do we use that? So let me tell you a little bit of a, of, of a way in which you can um, think of using this you know, in your lab, uh, which is basically using a, 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 a point of care, uh, as we say, point of care, point of care diagnostics uh, that's for isolation of exosomes. And so basically what we did uh, at, the, at the lab using the tools that we have at uh, IBM for microelectronics is a massive integration of these arrays that today, this is a little bit outdated, uh, today uh, when, when in the Nature Nanotechnology paper we had 0.2 microliters per hour, with this massive integration we are now at about 20 milliliters per hour, um, orders of magnitude, uh, faster. So we can really um, imagine that we can process uh, one sample type, uh, one sample from a patient in less, less than an hour, in a fraction of an hour. And so the idea is to put the, the chip, the, the uh, uh, integrated chip, in uh, a cartridge. Today the cartridge uh, probably, these are, these are all versions of the cartridges, but would look a little bit different. And then uh, uh, put in one of the uh, of these reservoirs the input sample and then extract them after a while from the other two uh, little files that are here. So basically, you can see it here in in this uh, accelerated uh, separation experiment, in which you uh, can see that the input sample is slowly being uh, transferred to the zigzag um, channel and to the bump channel. And you see that the BAM chan this is a little bit turbid because there were nanoparticles there, and this is more, uh, more clear. This is the zigzag because all the nanoparticles were go uh, went to the, to the BAMP uh, channel. Very good. So let's discuss a little bit uh, prostate cancer. So one question that we were asking ourselves is, um, usually, uh, you know, when you take a sample of, for example, serum, you have um, a you know, 10 to, the, to, 10 to the 10, 10 to 11 uh, uh, exocerial vesicles per milliliter, but which one came from prostate, from the prostate can, uh, that, that you are interested in studying, you know, is, is, is very hard to determine. You, uh, so what are the markers that are of prostatic uh, origin? So that's the question that we set up to um, uh, answer. So by the way, this is the, the um, I'm showing here the, uh, tissue under the electron microscope um, of um, the benign tissue of a tumor, tumor, uh, tumor tissue of the patient. And you can see that the tumor tissue has a lot more white here, which is indicative if, you, if we uh, make it a little bigger of uh, multivesicular bodies that inside seem to have exosomes. And if you count the number of extravesicular bodies, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, multivesicular bodies uh, per cell, you find that the tumor has about three times more than the normal, in, at least in this image. And, um, and this is one of the reasons why we believe, you know, tumor, tumors uh, will uh, shed more exosomes than, uh, than uh, uh, other tissues and probably a uh, difference there. But... In order to see that, what we did was um, we took um, uh, nine patients uh, of different ages and different glycine score, uh, prostate cancer, and we took um, all those patients uh, were patients of Dr. Tu, that um, is a collaborator in this study, and um, you know he um, did a prostatectomy on these patients, and so we had available the a prostate to study, and simultaneously with the prostate, we study the urine and the serum. The urine and the serum uh, were um, we isolated exosomes using UC uh, from urine and UC and nano DLD from serum. The things that you can observe in the heat map here is that the urine looks much more like tissue than the serum. And and that uh, and that probably is 
we need to study more that uh, the result of the fact that you have a lot more uh, ribosomal proteins uh, there after um, uh, in, in the urine, but maybe there is also a proximity to the to the tissue to the tumor that that makes uh, this to be the case. But the ultracentrifugation and nano DLD um, heat maps look a little bit similar, even though there are some uh, differences. Um, on the left, we see the correlation between tissue and tissue, which is about 68 percent between serum and serum, which is 71%, but between serum and tissue is really small. It's almost no correlation at all. If anything, there seems to be an anti-correlation. So this is the reason why we want to see if, if it is so different, if you look at the global, at the global transcriptome of tissue or uh, serum, uh, how can we say the, which which are the uh, uh, RNAs that really come from prostate? And so the question, um, we thought that one way of asking this question is the following, is let's, let's make the intersection of the prostatic tissue, and here we don't separate um, tumor from, um, from normal, from benign uh, tissue, and the uh, exosomal trans transcriptome uh, Patients. And so here, for example, we see that we have of the order of um, uh, 12, 13,000 13, um, uh, RNA types from the tissue and about 5,000 RNA types from the DLD. And there is an intersection for the, this patient of about 2,400 uh, um, uh, RNA types um, that are jointly uh, found in the tissue and in the exosomes. Now, if we do the same thing for several patients, in this case, five patients, and we do that also for, for the serum um, exosomes isolated with ultracentrifugation, and we do that also for the, for the urine. But let's, let's focus on the DLD five patients. We need to understand whether there is an intersection of the intersection. That means the things that are found simultaneously in the exosomes and in the and the, and the tissue of, of the different patients uh, is similar. And this is the statistics that we did in order to um, convince ourselves that that's the case, that if you look at how many what what is if you randomize the genes and you say you know suppose that there is no correlation and this is our null model no correlation between the RNA types that you have in the exosomes or in the extracellular vesicles and the tissue and the tissue then you would expect that all this uh, this is a log scale so but it's about you know um, ten uh, uh, eight thousand or so will be uh, only in one patient and you, you go reducing and you have to do a uh, look here at the, uh, reducing the number that would be simultaneously present in five patients. The number, uh, uh, said in another way, another wor uh, word, in other words, number of genes or RNA genes that you are expected to see in five patients at the same time if the genes were not correlated, is zero in five patients. However, we are observing of the order of um, 200, 300, this is log two, uh, genes in um, uh, RNA genes in the overlap of the five patients. And if we do that for, for the DLD uh, extraction or for the UC extraction or for the you see extraction from, from urine, we have the same thing, that we expect very few genes that simultaneously are in five patients in the intersection of their tissue and their exosomes. However, the real numbers is uh, very statistically significantly higher. So what do we do with this then? Let's, let's see how many of those that are in the five patients independently in UC, uh, or nano DLD serum or urine are also shared. And it turns out that there are 68 of those uh, simultane simultaneously in uh, tissue and, and exosomes, 68 genes that are simultaneously in 
technology, in the two technologies that we look at and in the two biofluids that we found. And this, we believe, is a clear indication that um, we can, um, in a sensitive way, uh, detect genes that belong to the prostate from exosomes. But this, is, this may not be specific enough. For that, we will need to look at the uh, disappearance of these markers when, the, uh, when we look at the same uh, tissue, uh, same fluids, uh, six months or uh, after the prostatectomy. Because if these are prostatic RNAs in exosomes, uh, once the prostate is gone, if there is no metastasis, this, um, this RNA types should disappear. And of course, if you do pa pathway enrichment analysis, you find the, that this is enriched in one of the enriched pathways is uh, androgen receptor signaling pathway. Let me finalize with uh, the story in liver cancer. Liver cancer is, is a really deadly malignancy. And, um, you know, the surveillance um, tools for, for uh, the early detection of um, liver cancer are suboptimal. Um, what is used is a, a, a protein uh, called uh, alpha fetoprotein and as the standard of care to look at it. So what we did is what we ask ourselves is, can we see biomarkers that uh, could differentiate between um, chronic liver disease patients but without cancer from patients with cancer? And... Um, so we had two cohorts, one we, which we call the discovery cohort, which were only 15 samples, five tumor and 10 uh, chronic liver disease. And, um, and this was plasma from these patients and uh, um, EV were isolated using ultracentrifugation and RNA-seq was done on the, on, on the, to find the transcriptome of the exosomes or the EVs from where 250 biomarkers were found to separate between HCC and chronic liver disease. But as you can imagine, 15 is a very small number. And, you know, there could be noise in these 250 biomarkers. So we don't have statistical power. However, um, another cohort was, um, was created by um, Dr. Augusto Villanueva, who is uh, the liver cancer uh, expert that is uh, leading this, this part of the, the work. And three of these biomarkers found in the discovery cohort were uh, studied in 209 samples, also of chronic liver disease and early uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. These three markers were studied using uh, PCR, RT-PCR, and Let's see what we get. So, for marker, and so so it's important to recognize we we discover in one cohort, but we uh, va are trying to validate in a di different cohort. In this different cohort, marker one was statistically significantly different in the chronic liver disease patients compared to hepatocellular carcinoma, versus uh, a, a marker two and marker three were as well with. Um, the, the small, the, you know, the, the worst of the p-values was three times 10 to the minus five, but, you know, the best of the markers was uh, had a, um, about 10 to the minus 10 p-value. So when you look at a little bit more sophisticated analysis in which you put together uh, all these three biomarkers um, and you want to compare how they are comparing with uh, the standard of care, which is alpha fetoprotein, only, which is a, a, a blood test done on these patients. The area under the curve, which, as I said, is a measure of the uh, accuracy of this test, is about 75% for, for alpha fetoprotein. When you con uh, consider the three markers together, we get to about 86% for the area under the curve. Again, the, uh, the accuracy has gone up about 10%. And when you put together the AFP markers and the markers, um, the AFP standard of care and the markers that we found, the combination gives us um, um, an area under the curve of about 92%. To speak a little bit of a, a more um, um, conventional um, metric of, of, uh, for this test, let's talk about 
sensitivity. In the typical standard of care, um, you know, there is a, a, a paper that uh, is an, um, kind of a, a reference for, for uh, the estimation of sensitivity and specificity of the standard of care for HCC. They found that the abdominal ultrasound plus alpha fetoprotein uh, in this meta-analysis had a sensitivity of 63%. That means 50%, the, this means about 37% of the patients that are tested that have cancer will not be told you have cancer. Uh, and the specificity was about 83%, which is kind of reasonable. But if we are using uh, our biomarkers at the same specificity, the sensitivity climbs up to about 80% from about um, 60%. 80%. So there is a lot more patients that have cancer that will be told you have cancer. And if you add the AFP, alpha fetoprotein with the markers in combination, you get to something close to 90%. And so uh, for sensitivity, now only 10% of the patients that have cancer will, uh, will be told uh, you don't have cancer. So the sensitivity has increased considerably. This is also uh, why I think that the combination, and this has been observed uh, repeatedly, that the combination of different modalities, for example, circulating cell-free DNA, and exosomal biomarkers uh, might, might be uh, a more powerful, more sensitive and specific uh, tool than just one of the, or the other. Now to conclude, um, nano-DLD is an adaptable lab on a chip uh, technology, adaptable in the sense that we can modify it to serve the purposes um, for the different applications. For example, change the wall to increase the, the concentration at the output. Um, it's a continuous flow EV isolation tool that is much softer on the EVs and probably that's why we have higher yield and ultracentrifugation. Um, and when we compare with other technologies, it's competitive or, or better. Um, transcriptomic studies show that nano DLD are more reproducible than ultracentrifugation. That this is what we have compared with. And we look at this in, in different ways, as I showed before. Um, we found a signature of about 60 or 70 RNA biotypes in exosomes or extracellular vesicles that are uh, probably of prostatic uh, origin. At least we find that this uh, finding a simultaneously 68 uh, genes that are simultaneously in the prostate of patients and in the exosomes and the same one in five patients like that and, and the same ones uh, uh, in urine and uh, serum is very, very uh, improbable if it were not that they are actually um, uh, you know, uh, coincide, coincident in the exosomes and in the prostate. Uh, and we have found that three... Uh, exosomal uh, RNA markers that can increase the sensitivity of early detection of liver cancer from 60%, which is today uh, the standard of care, to about 90% if we aggregate the standard of care with our markers. And this is a team that did the work in the nanobiotechnology team at IBM. Josh Smith was the uh, 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 master of fabrication and design of new chips. Um, with uh, Ben Wunsch doing uh, most of the experiments um, uh, having to do with the nano DLD uh, and also uh, with a, a big influence in the design. Stacy Gifford is our biochemist, Sam Chul Kim, our modeler, and Mike Pereira, uh, our engineer um, that helps with the uh, gigs that are used to the, to the experiments. At the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, Ash Tewari was the surgeon um, and a prostate can cancer expert. Carlos Cordon Cardo is the oncologist. Augusto Villanueva is the liver cancer expert. Boyan Losik uh, did most of the analysis for the liver cancer patient. Nadit Dogra did uh, most of the experiments for the prostate cancer patients. And uh, Edgar, Johan, and, and Aaron uh, contributing in different ways. 
And thank you also to the ERCC consortium because they invited us to be part of their cell paper in which we showed um, uh, you know, our technology separates one particular cargo type. Uh, in particular, um, Oscar Murillo, um, uh, Alex uh, Milos Avlievich, and Matt Roth. Uh, thank you very much. Gustavo, uh, very nice talk. A lot of work. Thank you. Um, we have some time for questions, so uh, you will be unmuted now. Um, I just ask if you're not speaking, if you can mute your device just to keep the background noise down. Questions yes. for Gustavo? I have a question. Angela Zitkovic from the University of California, Davis. Yeah, hi, Angela. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. <laughs> I'm wondering if um, it is possible to adjust the pillars um, in terms of the size and distance or other approaches to actually capture the smaller particles. Um, it looks like the technology does a great job of capturing the exosomes, but let's say if you're interested in the HDL and the LDL particles, would it be possible to separate those from each other? Yes, um, in principle, that would be possible. Technology could be adapted to other sizes. 